Being a worker aunt isn't all that great. You don't get to reproduce, so your life is basically pointless. But hey, at least you don't have to worry about being someone's dinner. Well, unless of course you're a slave ant. Being a slave ant might sound like a bad thing. But actually, from a purely evolutionary perspective, it is kind of great because it means your species has been successfully integrated into another species colony. You get to enjoy some of the benefits of living in a highly organized group with division of labor, which is one of the keys to an insect's success. And you also get to reap the benefits of not having to do much work yourself. Sounds pretty good, son. Hi and welcome to my channel. Worker ants are sterile females who spend their lives gathering food, building the nest and defending the colony. But there are some ants that live way better lives than this. Some species of ant have infiltrated other ant species colonies and enslaved them. That's right. These ants literally own slaves. But it turns out being a slave ant really sucks, even if you're a little lazy. Let's take a look at why. These Slavonian ants are also known as Ponarine ants. There are around 300 species of Ponarines in the family Penarodi and they refound all over the world. The name comes from the genus Ponarine, which is derived from the Greek word Ponare, which means evil worker. Because put simply, these ants are evil. They're mean, aggressive, and most of all, controlling. Take for example, the infamous slave maker ant, which can be found in tropical regions across the globe. As its common name suggests, this ant is notorious for its habit of raiding the nests of other ant species, specifically to steal their eggs. Slave maker ants target the eggs of other ponerine ants, as well as those of certain leaf cutter ants and honeypot ants. Once they have their hands on them, the ants immediately set to work, taking the eggs back to their nest where they then proceed to raise them as their own. When the young ants emerge, they're brought up just like any other ponerine ant, except that unlike other ponerine ants, these ants aren't able to leave the nest. Their limbs are too small and undeveloped. Instead, the slave maker ants have grown bigger, stronger jaws and stingers, which they use to defend the colony against invaders. So while their legs might not be fully developed, their weapons certainly are. Basically, the slave maker ants make sure that their prisoners stay small and weak, so they can control them and use them as slaves. But wait a minute, this seems familiar. This sounds a lot like slavery. Now I know what you're thinking. Slavery is wrong. That's not a thing we should talk about or joke about, and I hear you. We definitely don't want to downplay or make light of the horrors of slavery. However, the fact that ants exist that practice something that we associate with one of the darkest chapters in human history is pretty fascinating. And by studying how these ants function and survive, maybe we can learn more about how best to combat invasive species in the future. Not to mention it, it's just kind of fun to imagine a group of tiny ants holding other tiny ants in bondage. There are other slave-owning ant species that do things a little differently. For instance, some ants kidnap other ants' larvae. To identify potential targets, these ants have special organs called a stridulatory organ that creates a clicking sound when rubbed together. They use these sounds to communicate with each other and to attract mates. And it's thought that the strength of their clicks is related to the size of their colony. So if the ants are looking to expand their workforce, they'll produce louder clicks in order to get the attention of other colonies. When the time is right, they sneak into another colony's nest and search for the larvae. Once they find them, they pick them up and carry them back to their own nest. So instead of raising other species eggs, these ants raise their larvae themselves. But in both cases, the result is the same. The new ants grow up completely dependent on their captors, both physically and socially. They're unable to forage for food or defend their colony. All they can do is serve their masters. In some cases, the slaves have even been observed to clean the floors of their prison cells. Now you might be thinking, well, at least these ants get to eat. After all, they're probably fed by their masters. But in some cases, that's not true either. In Central America, there's a slave-owning ant called the Amazonian Slave Maker, which raids the nests of other ants in order to steal their larvae. But once they have their captives, they don't just raise them, they also kill them. At first, the victims are kept alive, but only until the Slave Maker ants eggs hatch. Once they do, the Slave Maker ants start killing off the prisoners, presumably to teach their own children how to hunt. So no food for these guys. Oh, and they also have to deal with some seriously messed up psychological issues. Researchers have studied how captive ponerine ants behave and compared them with ants that are allowed to live their lives freely, and the results were pretty interesting. The captive ants suffered from severe anxiety, depression, and helplessness. They showed classic signs of learned helplessness, such as refusing to escape from adverse situations even when given the opportunity. When their colony mates were killed off, they didn't try to escape or build a new colony. Instead, they basically gave up. On top of that, these poor ants had higher levels of aggression. They were less likely to attempt to escape captivity and they had more health problems. Basically, being a slave makes them sick. However, there is some good news for ants who end up as someone else's property. According to researchers, most of these negative effects go away after just a few generations. So the ants' children and grandchildren are able to break free of their learned helplessness and become normal functioning ants. So that's something, but then again, they're probably just going to get enslaved themselves. Now, 
You might be wondering why it is that these ants target other ants. Why don't they enslave beetles or grasshoppers or something? Well, it's probably because ants are just really good at working together. If you've ever seen an ant colony in action, you might think that all ants are mindless drones who simply follow each other's centrails. But in reality, they're acting very much like little robots programmed to perform repetitive tasks. In recent years, scientists have uncovered some of the mechanisms behind this highly evolved social behavior. The secret lies in their brains. Scientists have discovered three major differences between the brains of worker ants and those of slave ants. First, the slave ants have more N-acetylated proteins. Basically, their neurons have been chemically modified in a way that helps them process more information simultaneously. This allows them to track multiple inputs at once, like pheromones released by other ants, visual landmarks, odors from potential food sources and danger signals. Second, they have more sy synapses, are the junctions between neurons and they allow the brain to integrate different types of information. More synapses equals more efficient integration. And third, their mushroom bodies are larger. Mushroom bodies are associated with learning and memory and they help the ants recognize patterns and repeat behaviors. Larger mushroom bodies could mean that slave ants are better at remembering the routes to food sources or recognizing colony members. So basically their brains are just better at doing what they need to do as a member of a colony. And if you're thinking, well, duh, of course slave ants have better brains. That's kind of the point. I've got some good news for you. Turns out that even though they're better at processing information, their intelligence isn't much better than worker ants. Studies have found that slave ants are just as bad at solving mazes as worker ants. So despite having bigger brains, they're not smarter. They're just more capable of carrying out the tasks that they need to in their daily lives. So to recap, being a slave ant means never getting to leave your cell, being forced to do menial labor, developing serious psychological issues, and not even getting to eat. So yeah, being a slave ant kind of sucks. Of course, being a human slave owner also really, really, really sucks. And it's important to remember that while studying insects is super interesting. It is not a good excuse to ignore our own history and the horrible practices of slavery and colonialism. Thanks for watching. See you next time.